And so I want to ask you to please rise to your feet um, as I welcome the man that has had my heart for over 20 years. A teacher of the word, a world-renowned relationship coach. Um, I'm totally embarrassing him. He hates it, but I'm going to do it. Um, my friend, my pastor, my coach, my cheerleader, my biggest achievement so far. Please help me celebrate, Pastor King. <laughs> How you guys doing? It's good to be here. Pastor Sam, good to have you. Oh, for you it's good for you that you have us. <laughs> and I like your, your dress. Get, get me an outfit like this now. Even though I don't have the muscles you have, though. You and Ezekiel have muscles. Praise God. I don't know how you guys are doing it. <laughs> Praise God. It's good to be here. Um, good to have all the wonderful speakers, panelists, everybody. Nice to see you guys. Candon, everybody. Pastor, nice to meet you guys. Um, I just have like 30 minutes, so we're still going to do panel. I'll just share a bit. Um, um, we generally travel with books. We encourage people to please get books. Keep learning. That's the key. Keep learning. Um, one conference will never um, answer all the questions you have. One conference will never solve all the issues. So um, learning is always important. How many people here are married, if you don't mind? You're married. Can I see your hand? You're married. All right. Beautiful. Okay. Single. Can I see your hand? Yeah. Okay. So put in raise your hand. It's complicated. Can I see your hand? <laughs> Situationships. <laughs> All right. Um, loads of great books here. If you're married, praying for your husband, praying for your wife. If you, how many are there guys in the house? Single. Are there single guys in the house? You're a single guy. Okay, five. Five single guys, yeah. All right, all right, thank you. Thank you guys for coming out. I've still not seen my time out. Ah, I wish you well with that time you're taking. Okay, single guys, um, I want to recommend this book, Seven Qualities Wise Men Wants. Um, in my years of speaking and coaching, I found out that, um, if I were discussing that today in the Candin and, and um, Sam, um, a lot of people talk about relationships for women. And the truth is that if you are a coach that actually lives off coaching, it's usually more profitable to focus on women. Women are generally interested in marriage and relationship. Men, men, men usually most times don't care. That's why I'm happy that there are guys in the house today. Um, so, but <laughs> most, people, most guys have never been taught the qualities to look out for in a spouse. Thank you. Most guys have never been taught the qualities to look out for in a spouse. That's what I found out. Most guys marry at the spur of the moment. I mean, ask most people you know that are married. Ask the women, how did you know he was the one? For women, you usually hear things like, uh, when he first started coming around, I wasn't sure he was the one. He was not my exact spec. And I'll get to that later. Ladies, you guys are specked out. <laughs> I'll get to, your spec is too much. I'll get to that if I have time today. <laughs> you are just too specked up and specked out. So. Um, you hear her say, oh, she wasn't, he wasn't my type and everything, but after a while, I saw he was a kind person, or he continued and everything, and time was going. So I, I decided to marry him. But for most guys, you always hear things like, from the first day I saw her, I just saw her, and I knew she was the one. That's how most guys marry. <laughs> Which is not right, by the way. Because we only hear the good stories, the ones that did that and somehow, by chance, picked a good person. But a lot of other men that we do not hear from made that kind of decision and they are suffering for it. A lot of guys are in difficult marriages. We just don't hear about it as much as we hear from women. Yeah. Women, um, because women are more vocal, so when women are happy in a relationship, everybody knows. If you just see their WhatsApp status or their profile page or all those things, just like, when a woman starts waxing philosophical, you know she's unhappy. When you start writing love quotes, if you really love you, we show it. You know that somebody's upsetting us. <laughs> but for guys, when guys are being stressed out in relationship, you just focus on work, you know, they distract themselves. So you don't know they are suffering in silence, but they're suffering. Love guys are suffering. So 
Many men have not been taught how to actually pick a wife. Many men don't even know that there are qualities necessary. Many men don't even know their own needs in a marriage. The need they are in touch with is just their sexual needs. Many men don't know that there's more to a woman than just sex. So they are basically, there are about seven major qualities. Um, or yes, a man should want from a wife before you pick someone, please. So I dealt with that in this book. One of the qualities I dealt with here is that please make sure you pick a woman that gives you peace. All right? Now, women will say, is it that women who don't want peace? Ladies, you want peace, but you don't need peace. Men need peace. There's a big difference. Women want peace. At least they say they want peace. But let me tell you why you don't need it. The reason is because your mind generally can survive chaos. Um, <laughs> Women, women's mind is like a turbo engine. It's like comparing a plane, the engine of a plane to that of a car. It, it, they are, they are world, but a woman's brain is so... See, that's why a, 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 man, you see, a man is created for focus. He's a leader. So he's created for focus. He has a, what they call a one-track mind. He can only do one thing well at a time. A woman's brain is, 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 is like... It's like cables. We, we sat behind this, this screen and we saw so many cables, so many wires. That's how a woman's brain is. So many tabs are open all the time in a woman's brain. That's how it works. Most men don't know that many women wake up tired every day. Even while they are sleeping, their brain is going around. The brain is not sleeping. <laughs> Sometimes when you see women behave the way they behave, they are just trying to distract themselves. They need that distraction. Because that mind is all over the place. Because their, their role involves being versatile. So that's why it's like that. But a man has a one-track mind. So a man needs peace. He doesn't just want peace. He can't function without peace. How many men don't know this before they get married? They just marry anybody. And you see, as a man, without that peace, you can't even think through life. You can't capture vision. You can't become all the things you were created to be. So you don't just want peace as a man, you need peace. Your brain can't even walk. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So as a guy, you need to know what, the, what are the qualities that you need. They, they, they did some experiment, and they, they checked a man and woman when they were having a heated argument, and um, they checked the woman's blood pressure, heart rate, everything, and they checked that of the man. They found out that when a man is in a serious heated argument, his blood pressure, his heartbeat, everything, heart rate has gone up to 99, everything is high, he can't cope. That's why when a man might have his argument, the man's response is to leave. He's not, he's not trying to leave because he can, he's about to explode. If he doesn't leave, he can, it can lead to him being abusive physically. So he needs to leave because he can't cope. But a woman, they checked her own blood pressure, everything. It was the same before, during, <laughs> and after. Same thing. So that's why when the man is trying to leave, she's saying, you are not going anywhere. She's enjoying this. <laughs> she thinks we are just having a conversation. We're not fighting. We're just talking. Because she has capacity. That's what I'm trying to say. She has capacity to handle it. A man does not have that capacity. So as a man, you can't live in a place where there's no peace. My, my, my favorite mentor and coach um, when it comes to marriage and relationship is a well-renowned coach. Everybody here knows him. Um, people have studied him. All his, his books have been bestsellers every year, back to back to back, well-respected. I mentioned his name, everybody knows him. I call him Professor Emeritus. He's, he's late now, you know. Um, Professor Emeritus Solomon David. You know him? In the Bible. You don't know him, Solomon David? He's <laughs> Professor Emeritus. Uh, he had 1,000 women in his life. That's like everybody in this place being Solomon's wife <laughs> for more than this. 1,000 women. There are 700 wives, 300 side chicks. And it wasn't the digital age. You knew them one-on-one, -on -one, manually. No, no bulk SMS, no bulk. He was dating them one by one. No reminder on phone. 1,000. How do you even remember 1,000 names? And they were all in love with him. <laughs> so if a guy that has 1,000 women writes anything about marriage or relationship, you need to take it seriously. I know what Solomon said. Solomon said, if you marry a contentious woman, if a man marries a contentious woman, he will go and live in the corner of the roof. He said, if a man marries a contentious woman, he will go and live in the wilderness. You know how he knew those things? 
When you saw Solomon writing, vanity upon vanity, all is vanity, this world is useless. Somebody was stressing him. One of the girls was stressing him. <laughs> Just there right now. So all the guys, please make sure you get this book. I don't want to waste time. All these books will take our time. I'm, I'm trying to share something. But um, lots of books. My wife has this book, Kyle, Secrets of a Virtuous Woman. This is um, all year round. We coach women how to love a man all year round. If you're a married woman or a woman that plans to be married one day, this uh, um, 52 tips for 52 weeks. Every week, something to do to make your husband love you. There's all year round for men as well. 52 tips, 52 weeks. Everything you, what you can do every week to make your husband, your wife love you. 25 wrong reasons people enter relationships. Very powerful. If you enter a relationship for the wrong reason, you have most likely entered with the wrong person. Very important. Um, this one is heal before you deal. Hey, you don't know you are traumatized until... Certain situations. So everybody needs this book, Heal Before You Deal. Um, because I've lived most of my life in Africa, like my wife was saying, um, driving in Nigeria, some of you are Nigerians now, so you know. Driving in Nigeria is, is not just driving. It's, it's a war situation. You know, you're always maneuvering. There are no lanes. Nobody's following the lanes. You know how it works. So um, you don't let people just... So when I, when I got to the U.S. and started driving in the U.S., when I'm about to hit an intercept... So one, one day like two months ago, I can't remember. So we I and my wife were driving and uh, we were the first on the intersection on the light and they, they now put green and that means we were going to move. As we were moving, there was somebody coming from the other side. Now I knew their light was red, but the way the guy was coming, I just felt this guy is not, in Nigeria, that guy is not going to, that's how you drive. We don't, we don't, we don't follow straight lights. Um, traffic lights. So I just hit the brakes when I saw the guy coming and I almost caused an accident because there were people behind me. You know, I, I was still traumatized because I was, I was driving in America but I was, Driving like I'm in Nigeria. You see, that's what trauma does. You, you, you are punishing your next for the crimes of your ex. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? That's how trauma... I, I didn't know there was something wrong with me until that situation came. And my wife said, oh, why, why did you do that? I said, it's not something I did. It's something they did to me. <laughs> Is somebody getting what I'm saying? There are things in you because of the experiences you've had that can affect your next relationship. Ordinarily, marriage is a beautiful thing. It's just that people are carrying too much baggage. Too much baggage from their exes. Every experience will impact you. That's why you can't date casually. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Because it's impacting you, your experiences. So, um, heal before you deal. Very good book. Uh, manual, all ladies should get this one because I, I kept getting questions from women. Why, why do men, why do men, why do men? So I just answered a few of the why do men questions. I gave them a manual. Um, you know, if you're a lady here, have you ever noticed that sometimes when a guy wants to get your attention, he's chatting with you every day, calling you every day, texting you first in the morning, last thing at night, then the moment you say yes, either yes to the relationship or yes to sex or yes to something, you find out he just doesn't have time to text you. Has it happened to you as a lady? Mostly say, why do you do that? Because men are project driven. That's why. So I have to answer that. Men are project driven. Even men don't know why they get so demotivated after a year. Because men are wired for projects. The moment a project is complete, even he does not have the passion to continue to chase. He gets demotivated. That's why, I thank God, like Pastor Daniel mentioned it today, getting and keeping two different causes. Everybody has mastered the art of chasing. They've not mastered the art of nurturing. And we spend more time in the keeping than in the chasing. We need more skills, more discipline in the keeping than in the chasing. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So um, this, that's why men do that. They have a lot of, I answer a lot of why men questions in this book. So it helps you understand. In fact, we we're talking to Candon today and she was saying, um, why, why would a guy be, be texting a lady every day, say, how are you there? How is it everything? And not want a relationship with her. And I said, in the world of men, men don't necessarily think texting every day means relationship. But for women, talk. Women fall in love with talk. So if you're talking to a woman every day and you don't plan to do something longer, she's going to fall in love whether she wants to fall in love or not. Because there's a big connection between her vocal nerves and her emotions. It's connected. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? All those stuff are here. All right, uh, so today I'm going to talk about, there's all year round, Just Us Girls, my own favorite book of Pastor Mildred. How Praying for Your Husband is here, one thing, um, A to Z of marriage, wow, so love goes. How to know if he or she really loves you? It's not everybody that is saying I love you that even knows what love means. So you need to protect yourself, how to know if he loves you? 
I like this one. Making love to a woman without how to make love to a woman without touching her. This one is good. Every man should get this one. Every man. A woman, get it for your man if he's not here. Yes. <laughs> Men don't understand that women are not physical. Everybody's human beings are broken into four parts. A woman is first emotional, secondly spiritual, thirdly mental, lastly physical. I repeat, firstly emotional, secondly spiritual. Thirdly, mental. Lastly, physical. That's how she's composed. A man is the opposite. He's first physical. <laughs> Secondly, mental. Thirdly, um, um, ment- um, spiritual. Then lastly, emotional. So that's what happens. And now these two people want to live together. They're going to have issues. They don't learn about each other. A woman is first emotional. A woman is wired that way. So she reacts to things first emotional. If you want to get a woman to have sex physically, what you have to do is to get her turned on emotionally. You don't unbutton her blouse, you unbutton her heart. If you unbutton her heart, she will unbutton her blouse. All right. <laughs> All right. So, but most men are trying to unbutton the blouse. Don't unbutton the blouse. Unbutton her heart. Some men think women don't like sex. Women like sex. You just have to know how to make love the right way. It's not first physical for them. All right? It's first emotional. Okay, so, you, so I broke down those things in the book. Four different... Um, aspects, how men and women operate. All these things I'm summarizing as much as I can. Okay, let me try and get into what I'm going to share today. Um, no dry season. It's a financial devotional. Um, I and my wife are going to start a tour and a course maybe next year, upper year, on finances. What I discovered is that money matters in love more than we think. And I'm not talking about a man buying you gifts. That's not what I mean. I'm talking about financial peace in the home. Um, there's a way your work schedule will be so hard, you can't be in love. You can't show love. I'm telling you, you are at work all day, the shift is so tight. When you get back home, you're not trying to say anything nice to anybody. When you see your bed, the only thing you're thinking about is sleep, not sex. So a lot of homes are breaking because of the financial stretch. So no dry season is important. I want we come to America some years ago, we thought every American was rich, but now... We know better. So, financial devotional for, for couples to bless you. Common love lies that can stop from finding true love. Um, that's not, that one's very good. There's a lot of love lies going on. Then this one is who should I marry and all that, all that. Okay. Um, talking about who should I marry is a good book. I broke down the 10 C's to pick who you should marry. Many people have discovered, many young people have never been able to articulate what exactly they want in a spouse. Everybody wants a spouse. If I tell most people to sit down now and tell me what exactly you want in a spouse, many people cannot describe it well. They focus on the wrong things. Okay? I mentioned 10 C's in the book. Number one, if you're a Christian, the person has to be in Christ. Very important. You must marry another Christian. If you're a Christian. That, that's, that's the standard of God's word. Okay? Very important. I saw, I saw <laughs> if you ask the average girl, there are more ladies in the room, so let me speak to women. If you ask the average girl, what do you want in a white, a white husband? You first hear he must be tall. Tall. <laughs> Who will marry all the short guys? You see, many people cannot articulate exactly what they want in, in a guy. Many women cannot. There are so many things, so many tabs are open in their minds. They can't articulate the real things that will make. It says, oh, he must be fine. No, you don't want a fine man. You want a faithful man. That's what you want. You don't want tall. You want tolerant. Tolerant is more important than tall. And it's, <laughs> hallelujah, it's instinctive for women to say, I want a tall. Who told you that? Where did you get that image from? There are pictures in your mind. There are pictures you've seen that is informing your mind or your desire. Your attraction or emotion is not independent. Oh, you need to, I need to say that again. Your emotion and your attraction are not what? Independent. They are not. You, you just thought you need to obey them. No. You need to channel them. If you get better information, what will be attractive to you will change. Attraction and emotion is not, this, it's not, it's not, it's not independent. I want a tall. Have you ever seen any marriage that have lasted for 20, 30, 40 years and they are happy as a couple and they ask the couple, what's the secret to these 40 years of 30 years of happy marriage? And they say, ah, it's my husband's height. <laughs> it has helped us a great deal. Have you ever seen that before? Mostly say tall, but tall has no bearing on whether the marriage is going to be successful or not. 
Zero, 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 zero contribution. <laughs> but it's number one thing most ladies will mention. Zero contribution. To any, I've not seen any marriage survive because of the height of the husband. Not, not one. But everybody wants tall, tall, tall. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Choose tolerant, tolerant. Better than tall. You see, when you enter the marriage, the things that are important now change. Before the marriage, you want tall, you call wedding picture. Inside marriage, you'll find out a tolerant man is way more valuable. He must be a fine man. I've never seen a marriage break because the man is not fine. Well, I've seen many marriages break because the man is not faithful. So a faithful man ranks higher than... Now, no, this doesn't mean physical things doesn't, don't matter. They are just secondary. You need to put them in their right place. They are, they are good, but they are secondary. That shouldn't be the reason why you shouldn't pick someone. Just because of their height. Say, this guy likes me, just bring out your tape. <laughs> ah, two inches short. You're not the one. No, check the real qualities, real stuff. All right? Okay, so today I'm going to talk about seven ways to be a more attractive person. I actually have a book with that title. We thought it was going to make it to this event, but somehow it couldn't come out. Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31. Seven ways to be a more attractive person. Why is it important? Why is it important to be a more attractive person? Being an attractive person, number one, helps you attract the right kind of people. Number two, also helps you keep staying attractive. Being attractive is not about getting. It's also about keeping. Some people remained or try to be attractive to get, but inside the union, inside the marriage, they are no more attractive to their spouse. So the message is not just for singles. It's for married also. In fact, it's not even just for marriage. It's for every area of life. Why would, if there are five people looking for a job, why would we pick one over the other ones? It's because this one is, appears more attractive. And attractive and not physical, by the way. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Same thing with businesses. When you want to pick a, um, somewhere to eat, why would you pick one over another? Is what I'm saying. There are seven principles or seven ways to be a more attractive person. Take note, I said more attractive because you may already be attractive. More attractive person. So let's look at Proverbs 31, um, verse 30. Proverbs 31, verse 30, made it uh, clear that being attractive and being beautiful are two different things. Many people confuse the two. So it says, beauty is vain. It said, charm is deceitful. It said, but a woman that fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Did you get that? So the scripture, Proverbs 130, made a clear difference between beauty and attractiveness. Beauty is not attractiveness, by the way. So let's get that clear. I know most times we use it interchangeably, and the world somehow makes us think they are the same, but they are not the same. Beauty and attractiveness are different. The scripture makes it clear. It said beauty is vain. Now, please take note. God or the scripture didn't say beauty is bad. It just says... It is fleeting. That's how one translation puts it. It's something that is transient. It can, it can fade. Are you getting what I'm saying? It can fade. That's what the Bible said. It didn't say it's bad. It's good to be beautiful. But you need to know that beauty has a time frame. Are you getting what I'm saying? Beauty has a time frame. That's why if all you are building your life around is beauty, just know that you will soon be out of season. That's what it means. There will be younger, hotter girls. I'm sorry to bring that truth to your reality. If it's just your physique you are depending on and it's making you go crazy, give it two years. Hotter versions <laughs> are going to come out. If you are focusing on your bust, somebody bustier than you will come. If you are focusing on your hips, somebody hippier than you will come. That's what I'm trying to say. So that, that was scripture. scripture. Scripture is not against beauty. Just trying to say, hey, if you're going to build your life on this thing, you need to realize it is fleeting. It is fade. It can fade. So beauty was separated from attraction. It said charm. Charm is how you make people feel. It said charm is deceptive. Now, what do they mean? They didn't mean it's negative. They mean charm can deceive you into making a permanent commitment to someone that is not really good for you. There are many times we've committed to people because of, oh man, he has attraction, everybody likes this person, they are popular, but they don't have character. Are you getting what I'm saying? 
So the Bible is not saying charm is bad. They are just warning you that you can't make a concrete commitment or relationship based on beauty because that will fade or based on how this person makes you feel because that can also deceive you not to see their real personality. But they said a person that fears the Lord is somebody you should take note of. So, but today I'm trying to talk about how to be more attractive because somehow everybody wants to be more beautiful. I always say there's no reason why someone that sells weaves or wigs or makeup should be richer than me. The real reason why they are richer than us is because everybody wants to be beautiful. Very few people are focusing on being attractive. Have you noticed a lot of the slave queens are not married? Have you noticed a lot of people that shake stuff on the internet and do all these things? Nobody stays with them. Oh, they attract, they, their DM is full of people that want short-term relationship with them. So that's why you can't confuse beauty and real attractiveness. When we're talking about attractiveness, it's not just a short-term thing. It's the act of act. The way dictionary defines it, beauty is being aesthetically pleasing to the eyes. But attraction is having a pleasant personality. So if you want to stay with this person. Are you getting what I'm saying? So today we're talking about how to be a more attractive person. Being the kind of person that people want to stay with. And your wigs and makeup and stuff like that and muscles can't do that. Somebody get what I'm saying? You can't leave it just on the physical. That's what I'm trying to say. So seven ways to be a more attractive person. Number one, having a healthy self-esteem. Having what? A healthy self-esteem. What does self-esteem mean? I like that word so much. What does self-esteem mean? Esteem means, it's like from the word estimate. From the, it's, like, it's like saying value. Meas measured or perceived value. And I like the word self. You see, it's something for somebody to value you little or high. And to be honest, you can't really force people to, to determine how they value you. Are you getting what I'm saying? I've been to different places where I was, very va I was valued very lowly. It happened to all of us. And I've been to places where I was valued very high. You can't really determine how people value you ordinarily. But self-esteem is your own value of yourself. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? That's your, it's called self-esteem. What they're saying is that write yourself a check. If you're going to pay yourself for this weekend, all the work you did this weekend, can you write yourself a check? And that's when you know people who don't have value for themselves. Say two dollar per hour. Some people like one thousand dollars per hour. Self esteem. How are you measuring your value? If you want to be an attractive, there's nothing as beautiful, as wonderful as being with someone or being someone that has a good estimation of who they are. Low self esteem is usually because you are trying to build your value on something that is not permanent. Don't ever fall into the temptation of measuring your value by something that can change. That's the biggest trap. Not your degree, not your job, not your friendships, not who says they love you, not who you love. It must be on something that can't change. Your self-esteem. Do you know even your financial level is tied to it? Why do people buy things they can't afford? They are trying to measure up with somebody's sense of value. They are trying to become important in the eyes of somebody, sometimes a total stranger. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? And scripture shows us a principle of self-esteem in the book of Numbers. When the children of Israel went to spy the land, they said, we saw giants in the land. They said, we were like grasshoppers there. 
and say, that's, we, we saw ourselves like grasshoppers before them, and that was how they also saw us. And I'm saying, how did you know how they saw you? The principle is because eventually, people will treat you how you treat yourself. That's why desperation can never be attractive. When you desperately want to marry, you are walking against yourself. You know, there's some people like that, they are desperate. In fact, you can tell from their prayer, Oh God, I'm tired. <laughs> if you are tired of you, who do you want to pass that to? Even you that love you are tired of you. So who do you want not to be tired of you? You see, you are giving the wrong energy. You, many, many of you, by the way you pray, there's no surprise why there's a delay. You are not ready. You are, you are looking for someone to rescue you. And life is already too hard for many people. They don't want another rescue mission. They are not U.S. Marines. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So when you're having that desperate mindset, oh God, I'm tired. If I don't marry by the end of this year, 2020, Lord, if you, if you don't bring him, you will see my true colors. <laughs> Thank you, chameleon. So you have many colors. Wrong mindset. Wrong mindset. You must have such a healthy esteem that you see whoever is going to marry you as someone that is going to be blessed. Not that you need them to come into your life and save you. You must have a healthy self-estimation of yourself. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? I told the, I've said it before, if you are praying, by your prayer for marriage, I will know whether you are ready or not. If I see praying that, oh God, I need to marry, all my stars are married, all my friends are married, that's not the reason why you should marry. All my friends are married. Hope when your friends get divorced too, you will say, all my friends are divorced. May I be divorced? No, you don't live like that. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? The prayer should be, Lord, because as a wife, you are a helper. I think this is something women need to learn. As a wife, you're a helper. As a man, you're a builder. So when you're praying for a spouse, if you're a woman, it should be, Lord, ascend me, prepare me, equip me for the man I'm assigned to help. That should be the prayer. Not, oh God, bring you a many man. No. If you're a man, the same thing. Oh Lord, equip me and prepare me for the woman I'm assigned to build up. When you start praying, with the mindset of the mission. The Bible says we pray according to God's will. He hears us. Many of you, our prayers are not according to his will. They are according to our own will. Oh God, I'm tired of being single. Lord, my sexual urges are making me run mad. Just give me anybody. <laughs> when you enter marriage with those mindsets, you'll definitely be disappointed. Because that person is not your puppet. That person is not your toy. They have a life, they have a will. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So, manage that expectation because first you must have a healthy self-esteem. What's your value to you? Don't build your value on being better than somebody else. Because what you used to put somebody down is what you also used to put yourself down. What do I mean? If you judge somebody by the car they drive, for instance. What's your name, sir? Anthony. So, I don't know what you drive, but let's say Anthony drives a, 20, a, a 1998 beat-down Toyota Corolla. If I, if I see him drive up and I say, who is this kind of guy is this driving this kind of car? He's not my type, you see. You have lowered his value based on what he drives. The issue is that the day you go somewhere, no matter what you drive, and you meet somebody driving something better than that, you also bring yourself down. Whatever you used to demote someone, you also used to demote yourself. If you go somewhere and say, oh, I'm busted than that girl, the day you get somewhere and somebody's busted and you say, oh, I'm so useless. <laughs> that same measurement is going to come over you. So Anthony drives a bit, a bit down, to the day you get somewhere people are driving a Bentley, you're going to feel they are better than me. And they are not necessarily better than you. Jesus Christ said a man's life doesn't consist of the things he possesses. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Just because you are single doesn't make you inferior. 
Don't walk around feeling inferior. <laughs> Hallelujah. A healthy self-esteem. That's what I call the seven laws of value. If you are going to build your esteem, you need to know what, what determines the value of a thing. There are seven laws. I, of course, other things I'm just going to touch through them. Number one, if you're... The maker of a thing gives it value. The what? The maker of a thing. What's the difference between a plain white t-shirt and a plain white t-shirt that was made by Calvin Klein? You know the price is going to be different because of the maker. It can be the same material, same everything. If it's a designer's name, the maker of a thing, the Bible says you are his workmanship. Do you know who made you? The almighty God. And it doesn't make trash. Are you getting what I'm saying? I say it doesn't make trash. The maker of a thing gives it value. The price of a thing gives it value. The moment you know the price of a thing, your behavior towards it will change. Many years ago, uh, because I'm a pastor, on my birthday, people buy me gifts. So at the time in our church, people were buying me things I could never use, things I didn't like, things that they like, that I can never like. So at some point, we now had to announce in church that, hey, on pastor's birthday, please, can we all monetize the gift so that people stop buying him shirts and stuff he can never use? You know, just monetize the gift so that everybody will be fine. You know, and some things they give me, they have no space to keep them. So we announced it in church. Announced, announced, and now they announced it in church. Then on that same birthday, after all the announcement, somebody still came and bought me two shirts. And I, I said, oh, with all these announcements, these guys still bought me shirts. So I, I thanked him, smiled, everything. Dumped the shirts somewhere at home. Then a few months later, I had to go for an event and I, I couldn't find something to wear. I just remember that ah, there are these two shirts somebody gave me and I took out, I found where, where it was and I wore one of them. And throughout that day, everybody was complimenting the shirt. I'm, I actually like the way the shirt fit. And the shirts were really nice. I said, oh, the shirts are nice. <laughs> remember, I didn't like this shirt before. I like this nice. So the next time I wore the second one and I got the same level of compliment, same level of fit. I said, I like this, I need to buy more of these shirts. So I sent someone to a store in Lagos where I would live. By the time he told me the price of the shirt, I said, these guys are just hiking the price. They were Italian shirts. So I had somebody that was going to Italy. I said, go to the store, the real store itself in Italy. And the person went there. And he called me from there. He said, Pastor, I'm there. I said, hey, so I want to buy some of these shirts. How much? He told me the price. I said, be coming home. <laughs> go where you are going. Don't worry about the shirt. <laughs> <laughs> the shirts were, I don't know how much it would be in dollars. Do you remember, honey? It was like a thousand euros or something. So that would be like almost a thousand five hundred dollars for one. And this is not even now. Now I can't even afford it. But that time, that time, I, there's no way I could buy, buy a shirt that's close to two thousand dollars. You see, my respect for those shirts changed. Now I wash them myself. Everybody will spoil my shirt. This is expensive. <laughs> That's why I told you your emotions and your attractions are not independent. They are not independent. You just think they are. It's based on information. You see, I hated those shirts before. The moment I knew their price, now I treat them differently. They are not my exact size anymore, but I still keep them. I will, I will lose weight into this shirt. <laughs> you see, the value of the thing will change once you know the price. And do you know the price that was paid for you? The stainless, sinless blood of Jesus Christ. Nothing else can match that. Say you were bought with a price. That's what this Bible says. You were bought with a price. You are expensive. Don't let anybody treat you like trash. You are very expensive. The price of a thing. Number three, the owner of a thing gives it value. Number three, the owner of a thing. People like Michael Jackson and Co., they are still selling his gloves. Millions of dollars long after he's dead. Because what's special about the glove is Michael Jackson's glove. Elvis Presley, same thing. Because the owner of a thing gives it value. Some years ago, the dog of the president, the United States president, died. The dog, the first dog <laughs> of the free world. I mean, the dog's death made CNN and BBC. The death of a dog. Say, we are sad to announce the passing of the first dog. It was survived by the first, by the president, the first lady. 
they announced the dog of the death of a dog on in the news. There are people dying in Africa. There are people dying everywhere. Thousands, but it doesn't make the news. But the dog of the president, that dog is not an ordinary dog. It's the dog of the president. Do you know the medical care available to that dog? Or that you, some people buy dogs to guard them, but that dog had a guard. Why was that dog special? It's the dog of the president. You can't touch that dog anyhow. <laughs> the owner of a thing. And guess who owns you? You are owned by God. You are the apple of his eyes. <laughs> Hallelujah. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? You have value. You have value. There are about seven other things that give something value, but I don't have time to go into them. But these are the things that gives... Another thing that gives something value is the rarity of a thing. When they say, oh, this thing is, is, is rare. There's only one of it. You know, even people that, even things like diamonds, they try to make it scarce because if it, come, if it comes common, then it loses its value. So they won't, they won't ration how much is sold because diamond is just a stone, I hope you know. But the day it becomes as common as every other stone, then it loses its value. So the rarity of a thing gives it value. If this is the only, that's why, even, I, I, I love white people. When you see how they, are, how they try to make sure animals don't go extinct. Oh, I love it. I love it. And they follow these ants, or they follow these things, so there's, there's just about 300 of these ants left. And the guy is talking as if he, he has a conversation with them, as if he knows them. I like National Geographic. You know, these are 300 ants left, and you can see the ant is walking out to find water. How do you know he's going to find water? Did you people have a conversation? So like, there is, uh, the animal is about to go extinct. And they are protecting it, and they are spending millions of dollars to protect this animal. Millions of dollars. Guess what? There's only one of you in the whole world. Only one. And it's not just that. You see, when God said, there's no one like me, you too, there's no one like you. Not just now. There has never been anyone like you. There will never be anyone like you. There's only one of you that this world will ever have. If they don't treat you well, they will lose you. Only one of you. That's why your fingerprints are distinct to only you. Your eye people is only you that have it. There are a lot of things that is only, this is the only one. This is your personality. There is no other person that has everything like you. You are so, tap, tap that person you are sitting next to and say, I value you. <laughs> only one. Only one ever. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Tell your neighbor there's no one like you. <laughs> Let me jump. So I'll leave laws of value. Talk, go back to laws of attractiveness. Second thing that makes somebody attractive is how generous they are. So number one, we've talked about healthy self-esteem. Second thing that will make you an attractive person is being a giving person. Being selfish is natural. Being generous is spiritual. Being generous is something you develop. It doesn't come natural. Being selfish is the natural thing. And in the world we live in, the moment you become a giver, it increases how attractive you are. And I'm not talking about giving people things to manipulate them. That one is bribery. Because if you're kind of person, say, Wait, after I've done for them, after I've done for them, you were expecting something in return. That's not what I'm talking about. You develop being a giving person as a lifestyle, not as a strategy. I'll say that again. You develop being a giving person as a lifestyle, not as a what? Strategy. You see, whenever you see people that, are, that claim to be givers, but they always complain, those are people using giving as a form of manipulation. So whenever they don't get the response they wanted by the, what they gave, they go about badmouthing the people they gave something to. So that's not who I'm talking about. I'm talking about someone that giving is their lifestyle and they're not expecting anything in return. That's the kind of giving that actually brings a blessing into your life. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So begin to train yourself to be a giver. You can start with things. It's not giving, giving doesn't always cost you something. Giving a compliment. Giving a referral. Giving support. 
Train yourself to be a giver. That's what the Bible says, rejoice with those who rejoice. Because your natural instinct when people are rejoicing is to be envious. He said, no, don't, don't fall into that trap. Give. If somebody's happy, be happy with them and for them. Don't say, when it, God, when? When will it be my turn? No, it's their turn now. Let's just focus on them right now. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? And if you see in scripture, the Bible said a gift makes room for a man. That word gift there is not your talent. Now, even though it can apply, but the original context there is not your talent. They are saying the gift of a man. When you are a giver, it will make room for you. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Be a giver. If you are in business, think about how to bless mankind, not how to make money. Real givers enjoy this life more than takers. Because they first enjoy giving, then the rewards of giving now comes. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? See some of the women that married great people in scripture. They were givers. One of them is Ruth. Ruth didn't get married by praying for marriage. Ruth didn't get married by binding the devil. Ruth got married by serving her mother-in-law. Her husband died. Her mother-in-law's two sons died. The woman was bitter, was angry, and told the daughters, you guys should go, live here. Why are you waiting with me? Even if I can't have sons you can marry again, and even if I could have sons you could marry, they would be too young for you guys. She just cussed them out. But Ruth said, I will not go. Your people shall be my people. Your God will be my God. You know, we use that scripture today as if he's talking to husband and wife. No. It was a daughter-in-law pledging her unreserved commitment to her mother-in-law. Those who are married here know mother-in-law. How troublesome mother-in-laws can be. <laughs> but this Ruth was saying, you know what? You've lost someone. I've lost someone. I'm young, I could go and search to get married again, but I want to serve you, even though I know I will get nothing in return. Nowadays, we talk about Ruth as if she's a sly, manipulative, hot girl that somehow used her wisdom and her short dress to get a man. No, that girl used her heart of service. Same thing with um, Rebecca, Isaac's wife. That old man, Abraham's slave, said, I'm going to go and any woman I meet that gives me water and gives my camels water, it wasn't fleecing. He was mentioning distinct qualities. A woman that had a heart of service. And he went to that well, met Rebecca at the well. He was not an eligible bachelor. There are many ladies I know, they only smile to eligible bachelors. With the right height. Once you're not the right height or the right earning bracket, or you're not eligible, they will just show you their mean side. And they'll go about smiling to guys that they like. You need to learn to be kind to everyone. Sometimes you will never know where the blessing is coming from. In fact, if it's God, usually you can never know. You can never know. It's going to be unpredictable. It's going to come from the most unlikely, unexpected place. You can't orchestrate marriage because it's a, it's, it's, it's a divine union. So she was at the well. One old man, rickety old man, slave, came to fetch water. And the man had ten camels. Camels drink a lot of water. It wasn't a tap. It was a well. This means there was physical exertion involved in giving water to that man and ten camels. Many young girls today won't, won't, won't. Ten camels? You want to spoil my nails? You want to spoil my nails once my hair? My makeup in the sun? She forgot all that and gave water to that man. And that was the man that connected her to her husband. You must learn to be polite. You must learn to be kind. A gift always makes room. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Be a giving person. Always think of others and expect nothing in return. You can't do this as a strategy. It has to be a lifestyle. Always choose generosity when you can choose selfishness. Choose generosity. Hallelujah. Were well, you blessed this evening? Come on, give the Lord a big hand. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you. I want to pray for everyone under the sound of my voice. I bless every single here waiting to connect with who you have. Call them to serve. For the men, Lord, connect them with that woman that you want them 
to partner with you to build. For the women, connect them with that man that you want her to partner with you to help. Change our mindset. Let's move from being us-focused to being God-focused and help-focused. Thank you because there will be no delays. Thank you because our steps will be ordered. We'll be at the right place at the right time and we'll do the right thing in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Come on, put your hands together for the Lord.